Hi, welcome to another episode of You Should Sex It. Today is a special episode because in Poland we celebrate Mother's Day on the 26th of May, so very soon, and I wanted to celebrate the day by talking a little bit about the influence our parents have on our perspective or on our perception maybe better of our sexuality and our bodies and especially the impact moms have on their daughters. So today I'll be talking very shortly and then you'll be able to hear an amazing interview with my mom. Well, actually, I have a secret. It's not with my mom in English version. Um, you can hear my mom's voice in Polish version because I recorded the Polish version with her. But unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to record it in English because I was going back to Wales. So I asked my dear friend to play my mom. So I translated the whole interview. So um, like the meaning is the same. All her texts are the same, just a little bit different voice. But still, we can treat it as an interview with my mother. And I hope that you will enjoy it. Maybe I can recommend you now to listen to this episode with your parents, with your moms, because I think that it will be a very heartwarming experience. Maybe your moms will compare their perspectives on different stuff. Maybe they will learn something. For example, if you have younger siblings and you see that your parents are struggling with their approach to their sexuality. So maybe this interview will help because my mom wasn't really giving any kind of advice, but I think that she has a very wide experience and she has a very open perspective on sexuality, on body image. And I think that she made some very good conclusions that you can use in your life. And of course, an introduction wouldn't be an introduction if I didn't invite you to visit my Instagram, you should sex it, and my TikTok, you should sex it. And please, just after listening to this podcast, go there, leave follow, leave a comment, or maybe DM me whether you liked this episode or not. I can take any kind of criticism because I want to get better with every week. Okay, enough of my talking and let's get to the episode. And well, I could talk and for hours about relationships with our parents, but maybe I leave it for psychologists and people who know what they're talking about better than me. But today I want to, as I said, talk about parents' influence on their children's approach to sexuality. And you know, sexual education is a relatively new thing, especially in Poland, but I think that Talking freely about sex is relatively new all over the world. And because of that, parents could feel lost while trying to start these very often uncomfortable conversations. They didn't know where to start. They kept looking at the floor and circling around the topic. And, you know, talking about sex can be problematic because parents don't want their children to know they're having sex and vice versa. Children try to convince their parents that you know, they're walking angels, when in reality, very often, they're not. So such a bubble makes everyone embarrassed and discouraged and discourages from talking about sexuality very fast. Let's look at a very popular scenario. A family is watching a film. Suddenly, an erotic scene comes up and for some reason, parents cover their children's eyes. Such behavior can make sex be seen as something abnormal and even prohibit it. And, you know, I guess I don't need to tell you that what is prohibited tempts you the most. I think, and also I guess it's an interesting point of view, I think that the most problematic aspect of the lack of sex talks at home isn't the lack of knowledge about basic stuff like contraceptives or anatomy, for example. We can learn about it from the internet, from some reliable sources, uh, from an older sister or from a gynecologist. We can find this knowledge easily. But it becomes very bad when we feel that we can't talk about our problems with our parents. We can be uncertain if some sex situation is normal. We can have problems with our partners. 
we can have problems with our own bodies we can have a lot of insecurities that make us anxious and it would be best to talk sincerely with someone more experienced who wishes us the best but unfortunately in many households such a solution isn't an option actually i didn't have a classic sex conversation but i've always felt that i can ask my mom anything sex wasn't anything shameful it wasn't a, a mystery so i've never felt bad when this topic appeared somehow well <laughs> to be honest i saw a penis for the first time in a theater with my parents i was in the first or second grade of primary school so i was around like nine or ten and i think it was macbeth or hamlet I think now it was Macbeth, but I'm not sure. And yeah, my parents, it was my first like adult performance I saw. And back then I thought it was gross. And I really, really, believe me, really didn't want to look at it. But from a time perspective, I think it was a perfect first contact with nudity. And you know why? Because it was natural. It was very pure. It was with without any pornographic elements it was just a naked man looking normal i mean i don't remember his his body um his body posture but you know just a man naked nothing to that and my parents weren't afraid of taking me to this performance and that way they showed me that there is nothing bad or shameful in the human body that i shouldn't be ashamed i shouldn't be embarrassed i should look at it and think well yeah, it's normal. They've also, my parents, reacted very naturally to words like penis, vagina and sex. So they were just normal words like any other to me. Of course, <laughs> the face of junior high school destroyed it a little because these words made half of my class burst with laughter. I didn't have, of course, any kind of sex education in school, which I perceive as a big mistake because... I think that the perfect situation is when you have a safe space at home where you can talk freely with you about your problems, about uh, you can ask any questions with your parents, with your siblings, where where you can joke a little bit about that, where you watch films, where, you know, and sometimes erotic scenes are in those films, but um, you should behave naturally. But of course, very often your parents can't teach you a lot about biology, about um, anatomy, about some more medical, let's say, aspects. So it would be great if our schools taught us all that. But unfortunately, I didn't have uh, this privilege. And, you know, actually, our class tutor decided to teach us something, even if it wasn't in the program. But I remember that our friend from class showed us how to put a condom on a banana. And now, when I'm talking about it, I realized that it made absolutely no sense because he had never done it before. He was not experienced, just like we, just like he wasn't experienced, just like us, so uh, nonsense. As you can see, I had to count on my parents when it came to talking about sexuality. And actually, I think they played it off pretty well. However, unfortunately, I know that not everyone is that lucky. And some people can ask their parents nothing about sexuality. Such a situation is very difficult because we are forced to find answers and support somewhere else, very often in not very reliable places. And of course, most of the time our friends are there to help us, but they are in a similar place in their lives. So they can of course listen to us, they can share their experiences, but they can't really give us any wise advice based on their own experience because they don't have any. The truth is that as children, we treat our parents as role models. We look up to them, to what they're saying, what they're doing. And very often we repeat everything they say because we don't have our own perspectives on lives yet. I distinctively remember when I was in kindergarten and I suddenly I started repeating my parents and their friends' political views. So I was saying some random names. Of course, I had no idea who the hell these people were. 
and I had no idea about politics and anything. I mean, I still don't actually, but you know, but I just heard them saying that and I wanted to mm, behave as an adult. I wanted everyone to see that I have my own opinion. So I just repeated it and it's normal. And we also very often steal our mom's makeup. We want to have the same hairstyles uh, and outfits. It's natural then that our parents, especially our moms, I think, approach to sex affects ours. Of course, we don't always follow their lead. From my observations, children divide into two groups, followers and rebels. And unfortunately, when sex is a taboo, something bad, even diabolic, we find mercy in rebellion. We try to do everything in the teeth of what they say to show that despite the ban, we'll explore our own paths. But now the real question is, is it good? <sighs> Most young people become rebels at some point, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, this rebellion shouldn't be an effect of the lack of support from our family. It should be something we just do to, you know, show off or to mark our independence. But if we become rebels because we can't count on our parents, then I think it's a disaster. But okay, I can only talk from the perspective of a child born in the 21st century. And I think it's worth talking to the other side, my mom, who answered all my questions and she told me many stories from her experience. Okay, so maybe let's start by going back in time. Did you receive any kind of sexual education as a young woman at home or maybe at school? In both places, this education was basic, almost non-existent. What does it mean basic? Very basic means learning just a few things about anatomy. At home, there was no sexual education. I highlight no. Okay, so where did you learn about this stuff? Because, you know, now at least we have the internet, even if it's not the most reliable source, it still exists. And how it used to be? Uh, well, in prehistory, France replaced the modern role of the internet. They had some sources of knowledge about their bodies and, and relations, mostly from erotic magazines that their fathers imported for sale. Porn, yeah? Not really porn, more some kind of erotic videos. And besides that, there were many joyful conversations about someone overhearing their parents having sex. We treated it as something non-educational. It was all more about events that made us laugh or that were interesting for us. I think it doesn't sound good from a time perspective, but it was it was how it was. No, it's not that bad. And tell me, have your mother's approach to body and sex affected you somehow? Yes. Then how? Uh, I had a long pause here because it influenced me very badly. I was trying to overcome it for many years. My mom wasn't my partner and it was noticeable in this aspect of life as well. She thought that all my attempts to discover some knowledge or improve it were shameful, criminal and even diabolic. It made me look at my sexuality as something awful, something that can exist but doesn't have to. For sure, if you're trying to explore it and figure it out, it becomes even worse. And she spoke about it many times, so this kind of knowledge in my relations with my mother in this field were catastrophic. Okay, so how did you overcome it? Because, you know, if someone is telling you your whole life that, I don't know, your body is gross and you shouldn't touch yourself or look at boys, I, I guess that then at some point you need to do something about that, right? Uh, these bad relations started when I was about... 15 or 16. Now such an age is quite advanced in knowledge, you know, more or less how to figure it all out, even yourselves. Um, because the phase of negation started around that time, rebellion appeared. It didn't react by getting some knowledge without telling anyone. No, no. It was a, I was a total rebel. Um, if you say so, I'm gonna show you it's the other way around. I think it's completely natural. Rebellion is an obvious element of this age and I went through it as well. Um, if my mom <laughs> said that something was bad, I said, okay, I will do it, and I think of it as something good. Being a rebel set me free, but was something I didn't totally accept. I never had rebellious tendencies, and somehow they appeared. Moreover, they were linked with my sexuality, so I didn't feel best about it. 
Um, but I thought that it was the only way to mark my independence and autonomy, also in this area of life. My mom had a great impact on me, and also she had a very strong character, so I had to deal with it. And do you wish your mother gave you something in this field of life? No, I wouldn't want anything from her. And why? <laughs> I wouldn't like to talk to her about it. I know, because she wouldn't understand, or maybe it would be too embarrassing? I don't think it would be too embarrassing, but I guess in order to talk about stuff like that, you need to have very good relations with each other. You have to understand your autonomy, your diversity and different approach to some matters. For example, you have a different approach than me. It doesn't mean that yours is worse, just different. We need to accept them because you are you and me is me. So I think it wouldn't work with my mom. I just wouldn't even like to start such a conversation with her. Okay, and tell me, did it also look like that in your friend's house? I mean, did the lack of sexual education come from being raised in completely different times? You know, I doubt that in the 40s or 50s talking about sex and body positivity was popular. Or maybe it was just more about the personality of grandma, your mother. My friends had mothers of different ages. Some of them were younger, some older. I think that the whole society didn't regard sexuality as an important topic. We didn't feel the need to explore it wisely, without shame, without blaming, just doing it in a nice and mature way. A way that would give you the satisfaction of receiving this kind of knowledge, because of the lack of such awareness in many houses, this topic was marginalized, it didn't exist. We didn't know where children come from or how a relationship is built. And I think it was pretty much the same in all the houses. Uh, of course, it was also a matter of how our parents were raised. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, my parents were brought up in Puritan conditions. Then they passed it all to me. Luckily, you can either confirm or deny uh, that I managed to break free from such attitude. Now I can talk freely with you about sexuality. I also think that we both grew up with such things. Okay, but the truth is that it's many years later now, and it still seems to be a problem, because such conversations don't really work and are rather embarrassing in general. And in general, children don't want to acknowledge that their parents have sex and the other way around. So why do you think it looks like that? Why at some stage such talks aren't too natural and turn out to be unpleasant for both sides? I'll answer the question. Do you remember asking me any sexual questions ever? Uh, I guess not really. Exactly. And honestly, I was really waiting for such a moment. I didn't want to come up with my help because I assumed you'll let me know if you need something. Or at least I'll be able to figure it out based on your behavior. I didn't manage to find such a moment in your life. We started talking freely about sexuality when you started your adult life. I, it became much easier to talk about it. You know, I think that it's also because I got, let's say, interested in this aspect of life relatively late. I didn't ask because I didn't need this knowledge. But you won't tell me you got interested in your sexuality a month ago. Oh, okay, okay, no, no. <laughs> Besides that, be honest and, and tell me, have you never talked about such stuff with your friends? Or haven't you googled any information about your own body? Well, of course, but, you know, for example, once I heard the word anal and I wanted to know what it was, I had no idea it was somehow related to sex, so I looked it up on the internet and it was a big mistake. It really was. I watched some very disturbing videos then. You know, but however, I know that there are many households where people don't talk about sexuality at all. You know, it's hard to talk about something so beautiful and new in the life of a young person sitting next to each other in chairs. You know, I know that we didn't have this problem in our house because even in the article I wrote that I first saw a penis in a theater with you. But I'll give you a very simple example. Very often when parents watch a film with their children and some kind of erotic scene appears, parents panic and cover their children's eyes. Why is that? Maybe such scenes aren't good or beautiful enough. Mom, please. <laughs> I mean, these aren't porn movies. Usually there are normal films with some slight erotica in one or two scenes. I don't think such behavior takes place when it comes to kissing on screen. Uh, they can appear, though, with nudity. I don't know why parents react like that. Uh, but I remember there was the same problem in my house. I mean, I felt uncomfortable watching any kind of sex scenes with my parents. 
Well, I also felt cringy for a very long time when we were watching such scenes together and I have no idea why. It's some kind of intimacy. I think that after all, when we watch erotic scenes, something happens inside us. We can agree with it, we can admit it or not, but the picture works for almost everyone. One person will react lightly and another one will react intensely, but it is always linked with some kind of arousal. And that's the reason we want to disappear in such moments. We know, we suspect, that everyone notices that we blushed or that our nose is getting longer. <laughs> and is there anything that children do wrongly? Something that makes talking about sexuality more difficult, maybe? Because it often looks like that. Father or mother decide to talk with their children about sex. So they start talking and suddenly their offspring is trying very hard to stop this conversation. You know, very often they try to convince their parents that it doesn't concern them at all. Uh, children escape from such conversations and often they react just how you described it. Suddenly, they disappear in the bathroom or they need to do something important on their phones. So you are also the ones escaping, not just the parents. Maybe you feel embarrassed talking about that with your parents because you love talking about that with your friends. Uh, however, I don't know why parents are your partners in, in, in sex talks. I don't know that either, but it's somehow natural that it's easier to talk such things with people your age because they go through each stage of life in pretty much the same time as you do. So conversations turn out to be quite natural. You know, besides that, parents have some kind of authority after all. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. No problem. I mean, there is some respect and distance between children and parents. Even between us, I think we have very little distance. And we are friend and we have a friend like relationship. But it's still difficult or awkward to tell you some stuff. There are even some TikToks when you want to tell your mom about some fun experience and it turns out to be a five hour monologue about your safety. <laughs> well, it's quite natural, you need to remember about it. Parents often analyze everything by many factors. Of course, the most important factor is the happiness uh, that the child enjoyed his or her time. For example, it's it's great that you kissed five men at a party because there's nothing wrong with it. However, we realize from our own experience what we did after kissing. You know, I have to tell you that I think that it's your biggest advantage mm. and I always praise you for that. It's great that you refer back to your experience as a super young person because of that. I'm not afraid of telling you many things, as I know you won't judge me. It's surely helpful thinking that your mom used to do the same things you do now, or even more, makes you more open and less embarrassed. It also helps moms, so in this case, me, in understanding your feelings, emotions, and sensations. If you're close with another person, even if there are 31 years between you, it makes you understand each other better and it makes you trust each other better. And now tell me, when you look at our relationship from a time perspective, mm -hmm. do you think you did a good job? Uh, well, I think I didn't do any job. I mean, I did nothing when we understand a good job by one specific question. Did you talk to your daughter about sexuality? No, <laughs> because there was no situation that would give me signs you needed. However, I tried not to deny your moves, your actions or your opinions. And it created a good space for you to know that you can ask me anything. And I need to admit that you did a great job about that. When I realized that we won't have such a conversation, I did my best to ensure that whenever you do anything related to these topics and some problems would arise, you could always just ask and we would talk. And now, say you had a second child or could go back in time with all the experience you have now, would you still consider these straightforward conversations not the best option? Maybe your hypothetical brother and, or hypothetical sister would be a person with completely different traits and different ways of approaching such things. Of course, some people need such talk, but others will simply keep running away forever. But I will always observe to decide whether this conversation is always necessary, similarly to your case. If we were to have the talk, <laughs> I would have most definitely not done it in the previously described way. Come and listen as mommy explains everything to you. And generally, do you think that the mother figure has a big impact on a child? 
Not even considering sex per se, but rather physical development such as, I don't know, getting your first period. Or are they two completely separate beings with no connection whatsoever? They are separate, of course, but again, I guess this question should be asked the other way around because you are the one who should answer it. When it comes to us, I never did anything with an intention of any kind. I didn't necessarily want to educate you in any way or pass anything on. Maybe I was doing it intuitively, but there was no sheer intention for sure. You know, the entire cycle basically makes us want to hide, disappear. When we're in a toilet, even the slightest rustle of someone approaching sends shivers down our spine. We want full and total privacy. We want to be in our own little cosmos. Then all the unpleasant situations might happen, which include changing our bed sheets after a night because of the bleeding. It is something I believe no woman enjoys. Um, it deprives us of that sacred privacy. There is no good way to call this feeling, but it sure is an unpleasant one. Then women become obsessively hygienic, wet wipes carried in purses just in case anything is to happen. We do not want to parade it, no, parade it not to mention celebrate us being at that moment. But you know, it's changed a little, actually. That's great. Or actually, I don't know if it's great, but I guess it is just really individual. I mean, there are many companies which try to spread the message of not being ashamed of having a period, like they publish photos of tampons with strings, you know, being more open as in waking up and telling your friend how soaked your bed sheets were last night and you could have basically just thrown them away for good. Even in high school, no one really had any problem admitting that, for example, a stomach ache was caused by a period. I am personally pissed at calling a period these days or, I don't know, that time of the month. Let me tell you, my co-workers are mostly women and when one is on her period and all the quirks like lowered concentration or excitability follow, it is not so uncommon to hear stuff like hormones again, drinks, drink some cold water, just chill down, and it's all between them, people relatively close to each other. Simply disgusting that some women do it to each other. I really don't don't know why though. You know, I guess men are more gentle about that. Um, it is this thinking that since you have very mild symptoms, everybody's experience must be similar. But it's rarely the case. And men don't really comment on that so much and in such a degrading way. Of course, it's only from my experience. I never heard any bad comments. From men. Maybe it is because all the stories about the period they hear are, well, terrifying, so they do their best to be understanding. And saying these days or that time of month makes it harder to educate them about periods, something that must be done. I mean, how are they supposed to know something they never experienced? When you say it straight, hey look, I have diarrhea, my stomach aches and I can cry literally anytime, and sorry, but I might scream. The situation becomes way, way clearer. Um, that's great. If you actually manage to do so with your partners, my respect. But the women from my generation, the one before and I guess after to some extent, got their fair share of derogatory comments from men when on period. Hormones again, relax and so on. It's simply shameful. If I heard something like that from my man, or a co-worker, or any man, really, I think I would snap. I wouldn't be able to hold myself, I would show him how the hormones can really be raging. So again, my respect to all the men who, despite not knowing, we, not knowing what we're going through, remain respectful and are even cool enough to help. That's awesome. But some laws have actually been passed, I guess in Scandinavia, there is something called like menstrual leaf. I mean, some women's reactions can get so strong that even working or just functioning becomes nearly impossible. Okay, wait, I don't know how, but this conversation has really just been around menstruation for the last <laughs> part, but okay, but that's really good. You know, for me, period is something very natural. I was never ashamed by tampons or pads, but I know that some girls actually feel like that. Oh, I have an idea for an experiment. Try telling your man to buy you some hygiene products, you know, a little challenge to buy pads in a pharmacy, shop or a drugstore. You will see the real panic. They won't even know where to start 
best for them, you know, driving you there, dropping you off, and letting you do it. But for real, do it and you will see for yourself. Well, actually, that's that's kind of true, because I once took a tampon from Maciek's mom, because I forgot my own, and it was the one with, with the long applicator, and Maciek looks at it and he goes, damn, that is huge, it all goes in there? <laughs> so, you know, but it's hard to blame the man, though, for not knowing when women would literally just swallow the tampons and pads on their way to the toilet to make sure no one sees them. And it needs to be distinguished. It is not about sticking it into everybody's faces and going, hey world, look, this is this time of the year and I can do this and that. It is absolutely not the case here. Uh, I would like to emphasize that. In my opinion, the best thing to do is to simply give the woman her so very needed privacy. Of course, it is all my experience and I have no idea how other ladies feel, but this seems the most important to me. You know, exactly, because everyone goes through something different. One can feel practically normal and the other can end up in a hospital for two days. But maybe, uh, all right, let's maybe go back to what we're talking about, because I have two or one question left. I have already asked about the impact a parent can have on a child, but what about the other way around? Can a child and his or her views affect the mother? Of course it can. I can use myself as an example. To me, you are truly the best source of information that I have. I do sometimes joke about it because it is funny and it's cool. I know I might seem just laugh at it and be humoristic, but it's all really great for me learning new things in a way I truly enjoy. I mean, so, duh. <laughs> remember that I'm basically a copy of you. <laughs> I use this knowledge the best I can. I think you are a really good guide to this world. <laughs> you know, you show me its aspects. We won't maybe spoil, spill the beans <laughs> entirely, but I do really enjoy it. People learn their whole life and it always seems true, including in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Did you have fun? Yes, a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, so I hope you enjoyed my mom telling you about her experiences and her perspective on such things and yeah thank you again thank you for having me <laughs> okay guys thank you so much for being with me in another episode of my podcast i hope you enjoyed it i hope you have enjoyed all of my episodes so far and well the only thing i can say is that i hope to see you here next week. Uh, next week we'll have a very loosey-goosey topic, something very lightweight, something that you can listen to relax and laugh a little bit maybe. So now remember about the Instagram and the TikTok <laughs> and enjoy, relax and remember you should always sex it. <laughs>